Thanks. And uh, we're really thrilled uh, to have Mustafa Ali with us today. It's a, it's a great occasion. It's a wonderful day when you're a dean and a bittersweet one because uh, you have to congratulate all the people who have accomplished so much as your students, but then you have to say goodbye to them, which is a terrible moment, as Dean Jefferson and I know. But we get you for at least one more day or until tomorrow morning. Uh, and we were so pleased about the glorious weather that we're having. Uh, I'm Tom McHenry. I'm the Dean and President of Vermont Law School. I have that honor. Uh, and we're just thrilled that you could join us uh, here today. You should all have programs in front of you. And my view is that you can read a biography much more quickly than I can read one to you. So I will dispense with uh, doing so and just make a couple of comments about our speaker with whom I had the pleasure of spending a few minutes today. We were talking about uh, the gulf between uh, urban and rural America. We were talking about the gulf between uh, the environment and economics. And we were talking about uh, the gulf between ideologies of people who don't know how to talk to each other and they don't communicate. And finally, we were talking about uh, the incredibly important role of engagement with communities. And as we were talking about it, as someone who is a new resident to Vermont, um, I've learned so much about community here because Vermont is such a deeply community-based school. Uh, Jameson, right here, just joined the uh, select board in the town of Hartford, which is White River Junction, uh, and he's had a dose of it. I know a number of the students have had an opportunity to work with our select board. And one of the things we offer to our students here at Vermont Law School is this tremendous opportunity to get involved with our community, we are the only law school in the United States without a stoplight in their town. <laughs> and we're, we're deeply proud of it, but I think we do offer that opportunity to get to know a rural part of America in a way that many of our students who go on to uh, live and work in cities uh, do not. Uh, so I was uh, deeply pleased uh, when I read M Mustafa Ali's bio and found out more about him uh, uh, to learn about his engagement uh, with his community. Uh, he claims, and he may be able to tell you, that he grew up in a town that has fewer people than South Royalton. I was not sure there were any. <laughs> so I think that uh, in West Virginia, and his perspective on that is going to be um, very useful. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, in our audience there would be people who listen to hip hop music, and there would be people who thought that uh, hip hop had something to do with the hip operation. So um, you're going to have a broad audience, a very broad audience uh, to speak to today. And I think I've used up my time, and I want to welcome you up here and delayed to hear from you. So please join me in welcoming Mustafa Ali. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Y'all gonna make me take the coat off already? Let's try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a blessing to be here with you. I'm not real good with these things, um, so I probably won't be standing behind them too often. Um, I just wanna thank uh, the dean, uh, president, uh, faculty, the incredible, incredible uh, students, uh, the graduating class of 2018. Can you give them a round of applause? <laughs> So um, you're going to see some pictures that will be rolling behind me. I am not a PowerPoint person. Um, but I want to just sort of real share with you uh, briefly some things around environmental justice, uh, some of our questions around policy and law, some of the directions that our country is moving into, but also the power that we have to make real change happen. Um, I should share with everyone that I was raised in a family of Baptists and Pentecostal ministers and deacons and deaconesses. Um, and they told me I had 30 minutes <laughs> to be able to share some things with you today. Now for those, how many people know of somebody who's Baptist or Pentecostal? I wanna see where I'm at. No, I go some places, they ain't never heard of a Baptist person. It gets a little interesting sometimes. Um, and uh, I'm just so incredibly blessed. I want to share with you all also, I've given thousands of presentations around the country. And in each and every one of them, I always give honor to my mother and my grandmother, who are the rocks that I stand on. 
um, and who actually gave me a very strong foundation to work from. I'm blessed that my sister is here with me today, uh, who came up from Virginia to join with us today. But my mom, when I was a young boy, she told me, she said, son, you're going to have some tough days. How many folks in the room have ever had a tough day? Raise your hand. <laughs> Everybody look around. Hold your hand up high if you've ever had a tough day. Let's run over and touch. There's one person in here. We should run over and touch them. <laughs> Get that energy that they got going because they never had a tough day before. You know, it's interesting. Um, and my mom told me, she's like, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to deal with some of those tough days. Um, and I found some words of empowerment that I have used every day since I've been 16 years old, uh, except twice. And I will share with you all those two times that I didn't. And you may say, well, you're the one. That's why that happened. <laughs> but every day I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, and I say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Y'all try with me. I'm going to find out what's really going on in Vermont. Y'all try it. I'm blessed, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm highly favored. I saw somebody over there. They was feeling it. So let's try it again. <laughs> I'm blessed. And highly, favored. and highly favored. All right, let's say it one last time so folks in Washington, D.C. can hear us. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. and highly favored. Highly favored. See, when I said D.C., y'all got hyped about that. <laughs> y'all was like, I'm going to tell them what's going on. You know, it's interesting that we are extremely blessed because we have the opportunity at this moment in time to actually help real change happen. You know, people often talk about the civil rights movement, those who are blessed, and I've had great mentors who come from that era. They talked about some of the challenges that were in that space and how people came together to make real change happen. It's almost like the environmental justice movement. Now, I believe in real talk. Are y'all okay with real talk? Absolutely. All right, because I do this thing called hashtag real talk. So if we are going to have an honest conversation about some of the challenges that we have in our country, we need to understand our past but not get anchored to that past, but also talk about how we are moving forward to make real change happen. So in the environmental justice context, if we're gonna have a real conversation, then we need to remember when slaves came off those first ships and they were moved onto the plantations and in many instances were placed in the least desirable places on the plantation. They were taken away from their traditional foods. So for those of you who work on food justice issues, there is a connection in that space. They were given jobs that no one else evidently wanted to do um, so there's also that dynamic that goes on in relationship to jobs. We can look at our indigenous brothers and sisters and see a dynamic that went on very similar in the sense of them being moved away from their traditional lands. Again, losing their food, so forth and so on. We can look at our Asian American and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters, especially Chinese Americans. So we have this huge conversation that's going on about infrastructure. But we should also talk about how Chinese American, especially the men, were the ones who helped build the railroad system in our country. And the dynamics that go when you are a new citizen moving to a location and how you're trying to protect your culture, how you are trying to find a better way to be able to move forward, all these different dynamics go on when we're talking about some of the environmental injustices that we are looking at today. So let's come forward just a little bit. Let's go to 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Some folks say that was the flashpoint for the environmental justice movement because Dr. King was there working with sanitation workers who were under some very, very dire conditions, working conditions, if you will, um, and a number of other dynamics that were going on. Or, as some of the photos you saw earlier, Warren County, North Carolina. So it, most folks understand that Warren County was a rural community. It was a working class, African-American community, and folks in North Carolina had some decisions to make because they made some mistakes. What they did was, with those PCBs that were sprayed on the roads, they had to find a location to place that waste for it to go into a landfill. Now, there were a number of locations they could have chosen, but they chose a community that they felt didn't have a voice, who didn't have an opportunity to engage in the political process, who didn't have legal representation at that time. All these various dynamics were going on, and for many in those early 80s, that is the flashpoint for the environmental justice movement. Now, many of you who maybe are studying environmental justice or environmental history will also remember that folks protested. We see protesting happening quite a bit now. And folks decided that they would literally, as you saw in one of the pictures, lay their lives down on those roads to stop those trucks from coming in. There was someone by the name of Walter Fauntroy. He was a delegate from Washington, D.C. Folks in North Carolina said, Walter, why don't you come on down? If you come on down, there won't be no problems. So Walter said, sure, I'll come down. 
What do y'all think happened when Walter got there? Problems. There were some problems. And a whole bunch of folks got arrested. But remember, you have power. So Walter went back to Washington, D.C., and then he reached out to the General Accounting Office, of course, some of those initial studies, because we've got to have the science, we've got to have the information that ties to our own sets of personal experiences that are going on. That's the flashpoint of the environmental justice movement. But, you know, sometimes those types of things may not make a whole lot of sense to folks because it's a, you know, a little distance away, if you will. I want you all to think about something because many folks in this room have been blessed to have a number of letters after your name. And I know sometimes when we get those, sometimes we forget the connection that exists with Mrs. Ramirez or with Mr. Johnson or Mr. O'Leary. And we start talking about these issues about parts per billion and parts per million. Does that really make a lot of sense to most folks? So we've got to bring these issues back to their foundational elements, if you will. So I ran track in college. So in my mind, everything moves in seconds. I'm going to ask you all a question. In the last 60 seconds, how many folks in the room have taken a breath of air? Raise your hand if you have. Everybody, raise your hand if you've taken a breath of air. Find the non-air breathers. <laughs> Seems like a silly question, right? You're like, Mustafa, why would you ask me that silly question? It's an autonomic response. It's something that we just do. We breathe in and we breathe out. Y'all do me a favor. Everybody take a deep breath of this great Vermont air. Just hold it for a second. OK, let it out. I don't need anybody passing out. I know I'm in a room full of attorneys. I'm not trying to catch a case. <laughs> Think about something. In our country, and some would say the greatest country on our planet, depending on how you want to analyze that, we have far too many communities who still can't take a breath of fresh air. That is an environmental injustice. That's happening in both the rural and in the urban context. I want you to think about places like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, which is along the ship channel. When you go there, how many folks have ever been to Houston? How many folks have been to the Ship Channel? Now, all y'all go to Houston, but you don't go to the Ship Channel. <laughs> There's a reason for that. We go to the places that are pretty. We go to the places where we feel welcomed. If you go to this community, primarily a Latino community, hardworking folks, just like the folks who are here in this room today. How many people got an old car? Nobody going to raise their hand, are they? <laughs> well, I've had an old car, OK? You know, one where you roll the windows down. Yeah, I'm like, well, stop it. You need to make some money. I want you to think about something. When you go to this community and you roll your windows down and you take that first breath of air in, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. You saw some pictures of that community. You saw Cesar Chavez High School. So that was that high school that you saw the track. Imagine if you're a young person and you have to go to school there and you are expected to learn but not just to learn, to be able to compete. That is in our country. Or you can go to the Marathon Refinery in Detroit, in Southwest Detroit, and the issues that are going on in that space as well. Or you can go to Africatown. Now, Africatown is right outside of Mobile, and it is founded by freedmen. Let me see what kind of education we got going on here in Vermont. What's a freedman community? That's all right, we don't get somebody extra credit. Free slaves. Freed slaves. So these are people who were broke away from you know, the situation that was going on and then found a few dollars and decided to build communities. But yet now, there are tank farms that surround their community. They also have paper mills that were there that were impacting them. And when we talk about these examples of these impacts that are happening, there are different sets of dynamics that are going on that we should be very focused on also here in Vermont. Because in all the time I've been doing this work, I've never seen a facility come in and people's housing values go up. Think about that. When that doesn't happen, we are extracting wealth from those communities. And that's one of the reasons we have to pay attention to this. Here's the other dynamic that's going on. Also, when we have folks who are getting sick, then we are also 
putting additional burdens on our healthcare system. We know the dynamics that are currently going on in the conversations around healthcare. There are some folks who want to have universal healthcare. There are others who want to take healthcare completely away uh, from folks and just make it a, you know, strictly a financial decision in that space. That is a conversation that everybody has to have and make those decisions for themselves of how they want to support that. But those impacts that are happening to those communities, they don't have a choice in that space. Places like Cancer Alley that runs between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And if you've been there and you've seen, it's hard to believe that this could possibly go on in our country. And the impacts of cancers and all kinds of different diseases that pop up, very rare ones, we know that there is a direct connection that exists in that space. Or you can come from a place where I come from, which is smaller than here. <laughs> 500 people on a good day, that's if some folks from the other county came over and decided they wanted to hang out little place called Montana Mines, West Virginia, where we had a coal-fired power plant right across the river. Folks in this community work extremely hard. We also had a community that was built on top of an old mine. We also had the dynamic that for many years we got our water from a spring, but yet there were toxic metals that were in the spring. And unfortunately, my family and all of my friends experienced that at least one person in everyone's family had cancer. My father, who just recently passed away, had cancer seven times. Those are the dynamics that we are dealing with. And in our community, because sometimes we get it twisted, and there are some false narratives that sometimes, unfortunately, take root. Well, it's probably those folks of color who it's diet, or it's some of those other dynamics that people will throw out there. And the community that we grew up in, our family was one of only two other families of color. Everyone else was lower income and working class, white brothers and sisters. These issues affect all of us, and that's why we have to be focused on it. In the last 24 hours, how many folks have taken a drink of water? Raise your hand if you've taken a drink of water. Find the camels, find them. <laughs> Raise your hands up again, because I just want to see some, because I saw somebody, I'm like, somebody thirsty. Sometimes I need to say, not just a drink of water, maybe a beverage. I understand that it is uh, graduation season. <laughs> and there's some things that, you know. Again, we have an expectation in our country that when we turn the tap on, the water that comes out, one, is going to be pure, hopefully pristine, but is not going to be damaging to our bodies. But unfortunately, that's not always the dynamic that we get, or even from our wells because of so many different situations. You guys saw a photo that went by about fracking in our country. And the, you know, there's different conversations that happen in that space. There's the job conversation initially, and then we should be talking about, well, what happens a few years down the road um, to communities and to the culture that existed in those spaces. But there's also that public health concern that exists in that space. And we know that there, and you saw some of the pictures um, of some of the water quality that now people have to deal with. And people will tell you that there's nothing wrong with that water, it's just a little brown. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I've never seen brown water that didn't have sugar in it that you know, was supposed to taste good. So, you know, we're, you know, we have to be real serious about that. But there's also some other dynamics that happen in our water space that we have to pay attention to. And for those of you maybe who will practice Indian law, or some of the other forms of law around water issues, if I say Standing Rock, everybody understands how important culture is, but also how those water protectors were trying to share with us the need to make sure that we don't keep creating pipelines. We have over two million miles of pipeline in our country. I don't mind you taking your phones out and Googling what I say. You have far too many people come and stand in front of you and you're like, is that true what that person just said? <laughs> we should you should really figure that out because there are conversations about, well, we need more pipelines, we need more pipelines. And the Manchester community doesn't think so because the pipelines from Canada end up in the Manchester community that I talked about. And Port Arthur, Texas, two communities that were devastated by the hurricanes that came through and had to deal with all the dynamics that they had to deal with around air pollution, but then had to deal with the flooding. Now, I know Vermont knows a little something about flooding and the challenges in that space 
and how important it is for us to get this right because when we don't get it right, people are like, well, why don't you just move from where your family maybe has been for generations? What does that do to the culture of a community when we start extracting people out of that? And we have to pay attention to that. And if I say Flint, Michigan, so people often say, well, how do you describe environmental injustice? I say Standing Rock. I say Flint, Michigan. I say Flint because everybody gets it, or everybody at least heard about Flint, Michigan. But did they really understand the dynamic of how people's political power was removed from their communities to set this situation up? Do they really understand how, if you are impacted by lead when you are a young person, and if there isn't some other additional educational uh, things brought into the mix that you probably will never be sitting in these seats, you'll never have that opportunity, how your IQ points will be lowered, you'll have neurological issues and a number of other physical uh, issues that go on in that space. Do they really understand that when you can't learn, you are still going to try and do whatever you can to be able to put food on the table, keep the lights on, all the things that each and every one of us do all the time. And you may make some choices because you didn't have that degree, you couldn't graduate from high school, or you got labeled as a student as being disruptive because we also know that lead can cause some attention deficit disorders and some of the other labels that we now place on children. And you get moved to the side. That's why we do this work. That's why we focus on these issues. And that's why it's so interesting, and I promise that I wouldn't get too political in my conversation today, that we have an administration that curiously finds value in eliminating lead programs, not just at the Environmental Protection Agency, but also at HUD and CDC. Now, what sense does that make if we know that we have over a million children in our country who have been lead poisoned? And that we know that we are currently spending about $50 billion a year and all the issues that are associated with lead. Why would we not continue to try and move forward and eradicate this problem? When we talk about infrastructure design, why aren't we talking about how this plays into that overall process and how it strengthens our country? Or it's real curious when we talk about the air-related issues and we have folks who are trying to roll back the refinery rule, the methane rule, the clean power plant. How many people heard of clean power plant? Everybody probably tired of hearing about a clean power plant. <laughs> well, in our country, we know that we have 25 million people who suffer from asthma. How many folks know somebody who has asthma? Everybody look around the room. Now, if we would ask that question 20 years ago, there'd be a lot fewer hands that went up. Seven million kids have asthma in our country. And disproportionately, African-American and Latino children are the ones who go to the emergency room and who, unfortunately, are the ones who lose their life. Not the only ones, disproportionately. So why would it make sense for us to try and roll back those basic protections that many of the folks in this room worked for in the 70s? Communities with environmental justice concerns have been advocating for it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But your vote matters. Your vote has consequences, and we all know that. Um, and, and folks have to make some decisions moving forward about what they want to do to see if we can get this thing back on track. Does that make sense, everybody? You know, I talk about power, and it plays out in a lot of different ways. And y'all lucky you told me I only had 30 minutes, because I, <laughs> I can talk for a second about this. Our power plays out in the economic opportunities and if we're going to move forward on them or if we are going to allow someone else to. There's a couple of slides that kind of talk a little bit about this. So I want you to think about something. We know that, and it's beautiful that Vermont is taking advantage of some of these things. So we know solar is one of the fastest uh, growing opportunities and wind. Um, and we also know that we have some folks who, for whatever reason, don't see as much value in investing in that space. I'm glad you guys are doing that. Here's the other dynamic that I hope, and you know, the president has not invited me in for a conversation. I just want to be very honest with you. <laughs> Actually, I'm one of his favorite people, if you follow me on Twitter. 
Uh, and Scott Pruitt loves me. Oh my gosh, he loves me so much. I can't wait to get the hug on. But you know, it's interesting that we talk about China, right? We always hear about how we need to do a better job in, in, in our relationships economically of balancing out that relationship, if you will. But China is investing hundreds of billions of dollars in solar and other forms of renewable energy. So if we don't fill that space, they will. Does that make sense to everyone? And in communities around the country, like where I come from, where we all know that coal um, is a fossil fuel that is no longer really going to play a major role in our fuel systems as we continue down the road, why wouldn't we give the opportunities to men and women who, for decades, went down in the ground? This is a part of a cultural part. And did everything right, didn't do anything wrong. They were just looking for an opportunity to be able to provide for their family. My grandfather was a coal miner, got black lung, as many folks who went down because, you know, for years, respirators and other things were not a natural part of the process. There is a culture that exists in West Virginia and in Kentucky and Tennessee and Western Pennsylvania. There is a culture that exists in the Rust Belt. There is a culture that exists on the Gulf Coast for those men and women who go out and work on those oil rigs. And if we're not having a conversation about a just transition, about how they can continue to be able to move forward, then we are coming from our own place of privilege uh, where we're the only ones who are right. We should be having a conversation about advanced manufacturing um, and how we can bring these economic opportunities into those areas. And then we can find a meeting of the minds. And for me, that begins that authentic collaborative partnerships through conversation that are so necessary. Let me say that again, authentic collaborative partnerships. Because lots of times we have folks who, in, in this power dynamic where we come in and we bring our own sets of ideas, and that's the way it's gotta be on the back end, and it creates a crazy dynamic that's going on. So that's why we have to figure out authentic ways of having these conversations. The other part of the power dynamic that's going on, because how many folks, everybody close your eyes, close your eyes. That way you, nobody can look around, except for me, and I will tell on somebody, but I won't do it right now. <laughs> After the election, how many people were upset? I'm not gonna say you can be upset in a good way or a bad way, okay. All right, put your hands down. I don't want nobody to get in trouble. So. I remember after the election, people would call me and be like, Mustafa, what are we going to do? The world is over. <laughs> and, you know, we just need to figure out how we're going to move to Canada. Y'all didn't have that far to go, evidently. Y'all can just <laughs> come on back, come on. Now, if your name was Mustafa, you can't just go across, come back, go across, come back. I'm just, it just is. It is what it is. <laughs> the power dynamic, when people tell us, that we don't have power in a process. I'm gonna to prove to you that that's wrong. How many folks in the room remember the Women's March? Remember when, probably mostly men, said that a million women would never come together? Y'all remember that? And sisters said, oh yeah? I got something for you. They didn't just come and march. Marching is important because it gives a spotlight to an issue. But they took that energy and they took it back to their homes and communities and they said, we're gonna get engaged even deeper in the political process. We are going to support candidates who care about our communities. If we can't find one who does, then we will run ourselves. That's power. Y'all remember the science march? I was there. Now let me tell you something, scientists, I never thought scientists would come out their labs. I just didn't. And it was funny watching them try and march. And I was like, left, right, left, right. Never mind, just do your thing. But again, they didn't just march. They then took that energy. And when the government decided to move away from their responsibility of helping to translate information, helping to connect with folks, they said, okay, 
we will do that. You have the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Thriving Earth Exchange, academic institutions who are getting more connected with communities who need their help and helping to make sure that that information is there so folks can make decisions for themselves about what's going on. That's power. You have the People's Climate March, where we had black folks and white folks, indigenous folks, Asian American, Pacific Islanders. We had gay and straight, and some of the other titles. I, I don't know all the titles, so I, I just keep going with that. We had rich folks and poor folks all coming together and saying that we have to do what we can to protect our planet. And out of that, local governments, county governments, state governments are all saying that if the federal government, for whatever their reasoning is, will fill that space, will help to lower the emissions that are going. That's power. And most recently, y'all remember March for Our Lives. Young people saying that if, unfortunately, our seniors, our elders, and others haven't been able to move this to a place that will be more protective for us, we'll do it ourselves. Now, of course, we are doing it in collaboration with each other. That's power. So you don't have to give your power up. And you are super critical. Young attorneys, attorneys who are seasoned, you are the backstop against the craziness that's going on right now. Of all the actions that are going on, it's because of strong science and the law that is preventing the complete erosion of those basic protections that are so necessary for all communities. And that's why I'm so blessed and honored to be here to see all of these young faces who are ready. Olivia Pope would say gladiators for change. How's that? <laughs> that's who you are. And that's what's going on. And you see change happening all across the country. You saw some of the slides behind me. When the Attorney General from California called me and told me he was going to create the Environmental Justice Bureau, I was like, is that a new Marvel comic? What's really going on here? <laughs> that's powerful, because now folks have access. Uh, and some of the top attorneys are coming together. When you see some of the actions that recently happened, both in Virginia and in North Carolina, around environmental justice and equity in North Carolina um, and in Virginia, creating an environmental justice uh, you know, uh, council. That's a powerful moment that we're in, even with all these challenges that are going on. And that is driven by the people who are saying that these types of things need to happen. Or when you have Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey, whom, before he put together the Environmental Justice Act of 2017, took a tour of the Black Belt you know, all from North Carolina, down to Alabama, Florida, all the way over to New Orleans, and sat down in churches and listened to folks and said, what is it that you need? And he heard stories, because I was sitting next to him, about folks in Uniontown, Alabama, where there's that coal ash dump. And I know many of you in here are faith-filled and faith-based folks. And folks in that community, because of the impacts from that giant landfill, can't have service anymore because they can't breathe because of the fumes that are coming off of that landfill, along with their water being impacted. That does something to you. I like politicians who actually go and sit down and spend some time with folks. He also saw folks with the spray fields. Now, everybody knows about the big case in North Carolina, right? Sherry knows and how the folks had the $50 million suit. Of course, the judge came back and said 3.25 million is what you really need. I'm like, how do you go from 50 to 3.25? But that is what it is. And then also, for those of you who practice civil rights law or plan to, the Title VI case that came out for the first time in a long, long, long time, um, actually being utilized in a way that will be beneficial to communities and the state will move in the right direction, that's a powerful moment. It's giving hope back to people that real change can actually happen. And there are a number of other examples, and you guys know many of them. You see some of them that are flowing behind me. But this is our moment for real change to happen. Y'all do me a favor. Y'all look to the person to your left, your other left. Y'all remind me of them scientists. <laughs> look to the person to your right. Reach your hand out to the person on the left-hand side. 
All right, some people don't like each other. What's going on? I should have done some reconnaissance. Reach your hand out to the person on the other side. You see how I said the other side so you can't mess up? <laughs> Grab their hand. <laughs> y'all do me a favor. Let's find out if Vermont had got any, uh, y'all try and stand up if you can. <laughs> I want y'all to think about something as we uh, sort of close out here real quick, because I don't want to take too much of your time. I want you to think about this, that unfortunately we live in a time when we have folks who are focused on trying to separate us um, and continue to have sort of those, unfortunately, those silos in place. But Dr. King once said that we come to these shores on different ships but we're all in the same boat now. That is the power of what you're doing right now. Because in many instances, we'll get on an elevator, we'll look at the numbers, and we'll say, Lord, please don't let nobody speak to me. <laughs> Y'all know it's true. Or we will be walking down the street. This may not happen in Vermont. Our phone may not even be charged. And we might see somebody, and we're like, I'm just going to act like I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> It's ways that we separate each other. But when you actually touch someone, you realize that we're all just human, that we all have the same wants and desires and needs, and that there's something, it's almost like when your mom puts her arm around you after you've skinned your knee, or you fell down the stairs. Am I the only one who fell down the stairs as a baby? <laughs> but in this moment also, this is what scares people that there are two dynamics in our country if we're going to have a real conversation. One is money. Money drives things. The other one is the power of people. And when you do this, you have the opportunity to nullify the other one. Y'all do me a favor. We're going to find out. Everybody say power. Power. That wasn't bad. I'm surprised. <laughs> Let's try it again. Say power. Power. All right. We're going to send a message to Washington, D.C. Going back to 1968, put your right hand in the air. Let it get good to you. Look at y'all. Y'all ready now, ain't you? Y'all like, oh, shoot, somebody get a selfie. <laughs> Everybody say power. Power. I'm Mustafa Santejo Ali. Thank you all for a couple minutes of your time. So we have a, we got a couple of minutes um, for questions, and uh, y'all know I believe in real talk, so we can have uh, questions about whatever you guys want to talk about. Please don't ask me about the Samantha B. Full Frontal TV show that just came out. <laughs> nah, I'm playing. You could ask me. You could ask me. I'm teasing. Uh, if you raise your hand, I'll bring you guys a mic. I have a mic on this side, too. Oh, OK. All right. I didn't think I was that good, but all right. If there ain't no questions, I'm... yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is uh, Ita Quatron, and nice meeting you. Nice to meet and you. And my question is that you mentioned about power and money, and then we have a big issue right now, not only nationally, also internationally. Mm -hmm. And I'm myself from Indonesia originally, so I have a concern that most teenager childrens do not aware of the environment, mm -hmm. do not aware of the situation, what's going on in the White House, mm -hmm. and do not aware of the politics that's being separate us apart. And then how we can ensure that we build the bridges between us, make sure that we not collapse, and make sure that we hug each other, make sure that we instill the love and compassion, and then at the same time, improve our environmental issue, and then so we can solve this issue together, instead of standing up by ourselves only. Yes. And can we, how do you call that, send our children there and to the White House along with you? <laughs> and <laughs> I may and not be the best person for them to come with, but okay. Yes. I, I do believe that uh, most of those White House people yeah. elected privileged yeah. official that who earn money from the taxpayer mm -hmm. 
have their own children, yes. grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I believe that if we bring these kids and then speak up against this environment that they've been trying to do or eliminate the program that Obama era have done so very well, and then they might change their mind. No, uh, and, and I hear what you're saying. Um, Thank you. So a couple of different things. So we've, uh, in the environmental justice movement is an intergenerational movement. So young people and elders and everyone who's in between help to lead in that process. Um, the other part of that is going back to the cultural conversation that I was talking about. Um, so one of the reasons that I went to the Hip Hop Caucus instead of you know all those other fantastic organizations that are out there is because culture's a driver, but also the platform that exists in that space. Let me give you guys an example. I've been blessed that I know probably a thousand of the top scientists around the world. And if I lined them up on top of each other uh, <laughs> through here, and they began to share with you, you know, the impacts of climate change or any of the issues that we all know are super important, you probably would take about 10% of what they said away. That's just the way our brains work. Now, change the scene. If I have a young man who's standing there at the door, he opens the door, and Beyonce walks in here, right? And Beyonce, first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna pull your phones out for real then. <laughs> and she begins to talk about the importance of climate change or the impacts of floods and how they play a role in our communities, um, then a whole lot more folks are gonna pay attention. Folks are gonna start Googling what she's saying. How do I know this is true? One, I've been in the room when these things happen. Mm -hmm. But two, after the flood happened in Houston and she began to talk about these issues, I watched Twitter and other social media light up with folks saying, I never thought about these issues in that way before. That's the cultural aspect that we have to have people talking with young people who they can relate to. Now, we have to make sure that those cultural influencers have the information in a way that is honest and direct um, so that we're not feeding misinformation, you know, false news and all those other kind of stuff people talk about. But that's a part of this process. I see that as the evolution of our movement, is that we begin to bring in music. How many people remember your favorite song? Let's look around the room. Almost everyone remembers that they have a song that connects with you. You think about it sometimes and when you're not even thinking, uh, when you're laying down at night and it's quiet, all these different types of things. As we begin to infuse this information into those, those types of spaces, whether it's through music or other forms of art, it's going to resonate with folks. And I think that that's one of the other ways that we reach the next generation of leaders that you're talking about is through that. That's why we have People's Climate Music. Uh, in 2014, we did the home album, Heal Our Mother Earth. We had folks like Common. How many folks know who Common is? Y'all a pretty hip crowd, okay. <laughs> we had Neo, we had all these different types of folks who began to utilize their beautiful God-given gift to be able to share information. We do that also with our Respect My Vote campaign. We've had over 600,000 new people get engaged in the civic process. Um, and it's really making a huge difference because a lot of those are young people. How many folks in the room know that every year over four million young people turn 18? That's a lot of folks. And I'll tell you this, as I'm out traveling around the country and working with folks and speaking, all of them have said that they're going to vote. All right. That's a powerful moment right there. Yeah. I've, and you know what, I never tell anybody who to vote for. Just get engaged in the process. Mm -hmm. Make the best decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. Make the best decision for your community is where we should be focused. And if it's a person who's Democrat, independent, or Republican who cares about our communities, then we should give them an honest opportunity to talk to us, to share with us, and then make a decision in that space. That's how we reach those young people, one of the ways that we reach those young people. The other one is our academic institutions um, and our faith-based institutions, our barbershops and our beauty salons need to make sure that we have that information wherever people are. We should be feeding them the positive information that's out there to make change happen. And there are other places, of course, that we should be engaging as well. But I see that as a part of this process. I hope that helps a little bit. We can go deeper if you want to, but I don't want to, people fall asleep. Yes, yes ma'am. Hi, um, I listened and, I, I'll stand. Okay, <laughs> hi, I've listened and I've worked with young people for over 30 years. I am encouraged by what our young people are doing. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of them. Um, 
I've worked in an elementary school and I've watched our children do efforts of recycling and do efforts of connecting with um, other communities so they are informed. And I'm really very encouraged about what our young people are doing. Pretty proud of them. So, um, so it's working, we're giving them the, in the information and they're using it and they're bugging their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles. Don't throw that away. Do something with this. This is recyclable and it matters. Yes, yes I agree with you 100%, 100%. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, Will Davis, graduating this weekend. Um, I tend to grow a little dismayed when I see our regulatory bodies right. captured by a very, very specific sect of dominionistic Christianity. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how we respectfully engage with people of faith mm -hmm. uh, and what our, our faith leaders' special duties are uh, in this particularly fraught time. And how do we respectfully engage with folks uh, of faith uh, and encourage scientific and environmental literacy? Yeah, those are some good questions. <laughs> you make me work to get another degree, ain't you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, you know, there's an interesting dynamic in the environmental justice realm. Those people, many of the people you saw in those uh, photos, many of those folks were from faith-based backgrounds um, who came together, the Jewish faith, uh, Christian faith, Muslim faith, who were all coming together. There is actually uh, environmental justice uh, platforms in many of the major, sort of the Baptist Convention, Methodist, so forth and so on. Of course, we all know how the Pope feels about many of these issues. So, you know, sometimes folks who are doing the right thing don't get the attention as those who are a little off. I don't know what word I want to use with the off, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so that's an, an, an interesting dynamic that's going on. Uh, and you have a number of them who are very focused. I, I sit down and work with some of the Catholic bishops and, and others who are focused. Here's what I ask folks, especially those of us who claim to be uh, folks who are faith-centered, um, and especially if you're Christian. Um, when some of these dynamics are going on and people are trying to justify certain things, I ask the question, what would Jesus do? Would he be in support of what you were trying to move forward? And then you have to go from there. Now, that puts people in an interesting place because they're like, well, wait a minute now. Why you got to bring Jesus into it? <laughs> well, if that's supposed to be our spiritual leader, would he agree with this? Now, for those in other faiths, they have to, you know, utilize uh, the person who or the entity who is their, um, you know, leader. Um, but those are the ways that I approach it. I just want to leave with there are lots of folks in the faith-based community um, who are doing some incredible work. Um, and who are trying their best um, to hold to the true values um, that our country is supposed to be founded on and definitely that our various religious factions are, are focused on. So that's the way that I do it. Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Let me back up because I know it's going to be a good question. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's going to be a question or not. It's okay. a request. Yes, ma'am. But I did think when you were talking about... Um, the, the, the impact that the scientist has versus the musician. One time I was giving a speech and it fell along racial lines, it just did. Okay. And I got a question, why don't black people care about the environment? And I had Marvin Gaye playing in the background with what's going on and I thought, yeah. maybe we should listen just a little bit harder. Right. So anyway, <laughs> yes, yes. but my request is, but he knows, we know each other. <laughs> She's like my second mom. Yeah. And young. I'll cop to it, you know. Yeah. Here's my <laughs> but seriously, the one thing I think you might, and this audience probably has a sense of it, mm -hmm. much more so than many, mm -hmm. but I always think it's really important for us to understand and to recognize that much of the environmental justice issues that we deal with in the United States, the allegiance and alliance mm -hmm. that is available to us when we think about the Wangari Mathais mm -hmm. or the Ken Zerawiwas, mm -hmm. you know, who was executed in Nigeria. So it's two points. One, those are their economic, social, environmental, et cetera, issues that never got divided up and compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. They are truly our allies, mm -hmm. but also to remind us how much literally their lives, particularly politically, are often on the line when they do those. So it's not just um, however 
meaningfully an exercise, it is literally life and death. Oh, I agree. I agree. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I know we're real short on time. I want to share with you all because sometimes you need examples to be able to share with others of why and how this work comes together. So if you all give me two minutes, I want to give me three minutes. I, I, I want to sort of talk to you about what real environmental justice looks like. How do we really revitalize communities? People who follow me know I often talk about that. Um, and how the law, policy, um, job creation, all these things come together. How many folks have been to South Carolina? We're going to watch this. So some folks have been to South Carolina. How many folks have been to Spartanburg, South Carolina? All right, so just a couple of hands. There's a community there that's not so different than where we sit here today uh, or many of the communities across our country. They got an environmental justice small grant. Now, the environmental justice small grant program actually came out of a set of recommendations from environmental justice leaders in the late 80s. Also, um, our president was trying to eliminate that grant program. They got this $20,000 grant, and they took a look at some of the dynamics that were happening inside of their community, uh, both the impacts, but also opportunities that people wanted. So they had the same dynamics many of our communities have. They had bad transportation routes. So they had one way in and one way out of this rural community, OK? And, but they also had a railroad track. And um, the railroads used to come and sit right on the road where you could get out and sit there and idle for hours. It's kind of crazy, but they did. They had brownfields and Superfund sites. You guys know what that is. Those are some of the most toxic sites. And they also had a chemical facility and an old medical waste landfill that wasn't supposed to be there, but was there, OK? So we all have seen some of these types of things going on. They also had lack of access to health care. So seniors had to travel like a half an hour to get to health care. They also, for those of you who work on food desert or food justice issues, they had a supermarket that you had to take a half an hour to get to the supermarket. Now, for some folks, that's hard to believe, but that's the dynamic that they were dealing with. They also didn't have a community center. How many folks know what shotgun housing is? Oh, OK. So they had shotgun housing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you open up the front door, can see out the back door, OK? No energy efficiency, any of those types of things. Although many of our uh, ancestors and others used to use newspapers and other things for their energy, you know, to help to keep the wind out and keep things going, the insulation. So they had that going on. So fast forward. They took that $20,000 grant, and they've leveraged it in over $300 million in changes. Let me talk to you about what those changes look like. One, they've got 144 partners who are now a part of the process. They work with the railroad to keep the train from doing it. That seemed real simple, right? That's just like common sense. They got a new transportation route and beautification programs in there. So remember that old shotgun housing I talked about? Now, y'all know it gets hot in South Carolina in the summer, right? OK. So they were paying three to $400 a month for their electricity costs. We got 500 new green homes into that community. Now they're paying $67 a month. So that's more disposable income. Got a supermarket in there and built uh, additional businesses then came to create economic opportunities, but also to deal with that food desert issue that was going on. They also have a new green community center where seniors come and young people come to learn and to socialize, which is important also in holding together uh, that community. Um, they also now have uh, a number of other things. They have five. Let me say it again. They have five healthcare centers. So those healthcare centers now create jobs and also deal with some of those disproportionate health impacts. Um, the dollars from that came from the CDC and some of the foundations and some other folks. The new transportation routes came uh, through the Tiger Grant program that they've been trying to eliminate. Um, and they created worker training programs so that the residents in this community were the ones who were doing the rebuilding. Remember the brownfields and Superfund sites I talked about real quickly? Those have been cleaned up, and they're putting a 35-acre solar farm there. So now their electricity costs that were three to $400 a month went down to $67 a month. Now will be zeroed out, and the excess that went to the grid will come back to the community in the form of rebates. That's what environmental justice is. It's about taking these negative impacts that are happening and then being able to do it. Here's the other dynamic I know many of you will care about. They understood that if they didn't get engaged in the political process, they would continue to get the uh, scraps from the table, if you want to say it that way. So they got folks on the city council. They got folks in the county commission. And eventually, they got uh, Harold Mitchell, executive director of the Regenesis Project, into the state house. There, he partnered with Reverend Pickney. 
Why is that name familiar? Because Reverend Pickney was one of the folks who were in that church in South Carolina, unfortunately, when the young man came in and did what he did. But before that, they were able to get a solar bill in South Carolina, a red state, whatever that's supposed to mean. And most folks don't even know that all of this was driven from a community project. They are the ones who pushed that and made that kind of change happen. We can do that here in Vermont. We can do that throughout the Rust Belt. We can do it on the Gulf Coast. If we listen to the voice of communities and build what? Authentic collaborative partnerships. That's how we make our country greater again. <laughs> By giving back to local communities the ability to make real change happen. And throughout that process, they had attorneys who were helping to guide them to make sure that right decisions you know, were, were handled uh, in that space. That's how we partner and make real change happen, one of the ways. So I just wanted to share that, because I wanted to make sure that when you walk out of this room and people tell you, oh, we can't do this and you can't do that, yeah, yeah, we can. We have power, and we can make real change happen. There it is. That's wonderful. We're going to get you up here in a second, sir. Okay. Sometimes in a forester's overstay, outward seminary. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead and sit down. We have a little uh, something more we want to say. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me introduce on my left is our associate dean of students, Shirley Jefferson. And on my right, Colleen Connor, a Vermont Law School graduate and the chair of our Board of Trustees. Uh, I'd like to read something and then we have a little hooding ceremony that we're going to provide. Uh -oh. Mustafa Santiago Ali, you have been relentless in your pursuit of environmental justice, speaking truth to power, articulating a vision for a better world and working to make that vision a reality. And we've seen that today, so thank you. For almost 25 years, you worked tirelessly to build the Office of Environmental Justice at the Environmental Protection Agency, while simultaneously helping other federal agencies as they began to tackle environmental justice issues in their own programs. Mustafa, through your work, you bring to life the Vermont Law School motto, Lex Pro Urbe et Orbe, Law for the Community and the World. By bringing together communities, young adults, activists, and leaders from across the country and educating them on the issues of climate change and environmental health, you are spreading the environmental justice message around the world. Therefore, by virtue of the authority vested, vested in the Board of Trustees of Vermont Law School, we have conferred upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa, which means honorary, <laughs> and welcome you to all the honors, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto. So if you join me on the stage. Do it proudly. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And Mustafa is going to give the commencement address at Green Mountain College tomorrow. <laughs> and, and he may be available if you want to come up to the stage and have individual specific questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much. You're fantastic.
Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you.